What's up, everybody? Welcome to The Better You Project, optimizing health hormones and aesthetics. And today I have a very special guest, one of my all-time favorite chiropractors of the universe. We've got Dr. Drew Eliszewski. Did I pronounce that right? Eliszewski, yeah. No, that's pretty good. Okay, all it. right. So Dr. Drew is a board-certified chiropractor, gad graduated from Palmer Chiropractic in 2017. He has a passion for sports medicine with special interest in soft tissue rehab and has worked with many professionals, collegiate athletes throughout his career. He has studied functional medicine, integrative nutrition since graduating chiropractic school with his biggest passions for blood sugar regulation, weight loss, fatty liver disease, and probably all the comorbidities that go along with that. Together, he and his wife, who is fantastic, she has also been a guest on our podcast. Her name is Tracy E, is what we call her at, at our practice when we refer to Tracy. Tracy E, um, she and her husband operate Forum Health in Madison, Wisconsin, as well as their own clinic, True Health. They have also developed their own supplement company that is focused on clean performance line for athletes called Patriot Performance Supplement Co. I will tag all those things in the social. Uh, they have their own podcast called The Vitality Bru Blueprint with episodes launching in the next few weeks. So, you ready? I am. Okay. So, Drew, welcome to the welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule with your wonderful wife, who I absolutely adore. Um, you guys are always so fun to hang out with in the um, the conference circuit and just great people in general. And that's what this is about is building relationships with other practitioners that we can bounce ideas off of, um, collaborate, and just really build a better healthcare system in general, right? I mean, no big deal. So let's talk first about what are we going to talk about today? My goal is to <coughs> jump into some mold toxicity. Um, full disclosure, I, in my practice, do a lot of things. I do not treat mold disease. I don't work it up. A lot of times I will refer this out to local practitioners who do this. However, I think it's important for listeners, whether you are a patient or you're a practitioner, to understand how to identify some of these things. And then if you're interested in, in having that evaluated, what does that road look like towards the workup, causes, um, diagnostics, treatment, and all those things. So, Drew, you ready? Yes. Okay. Let's first talk about how did you get interested in mold toxicity? Yeah, so <clears throat> kind of like you, Lexi. Um, I just didn't like, this wasn't like attractive for me, right? Like this isn't something I really wanted to dive into, um, because it, you know, you see, you hear about these patients and how complicated they things can get. And you're like, I don't really know if I want to go down that route. Right. But so looking back at it, it, it was kind of like a sequence of events of how this got started for me. Number one, like the first thing that uh, uh, happened when I was like about a week into starting this functional medicine journey and opening up to for patients was I had this phone call happen and it was with this guy. He called me, he said, hey, look, I'm trying to see if I am a good fit for your practice. Here's my symptoms. And he listed off a laundry list of symptoms. He had, uh, he would uh, have extreme vomiting episodes. He had uh, extreme nausea, dizziness, uh, super sensitive to all these foods. He could only eat about like, you know, 10 foods. Um, he was reactive, really reactive to medications. And um, it's all stimulated after he had head trauma. But uh, now knowing what I know, and we'll get into that, like how head trauma can play a role into um, kind of overloading the bucket, um, I was just like starting to think. And I was like, hey, look, at this time, um, I was just really honest with this guy. And I said, I don't know if I can help you. Um, this seems, you know, very complicated. When he was telling me he could only take a, a uh, a, a supplement like a B vitamin, and it was the size of a pencil tip. And if he took anything more than that, he would go into this extreme vomiting episode. And so I wasn't willing to take it on at that time. And I didn't really think much about it after that. <clears throat> Fast forward two months later, I get a similar phone call from a different person. Uh, and this time it was a lady. And it's very similar in the symptomatology. Um, and again, uh, Talking to this patient, I was like, hey, look, here's another place that we can go. Then a couple months later, I get this patient come into my office and she was looking for hormones. Um, she was referred to me from another chiropractor. We did a lot of Dutch testing, stool testing, blood, blood chemistry evaluation at this time and helping a lot of people um, with those things. Um, but this patient comes into me and she's like, um, 
she's a mother and she um, started having all these symptoms, I believe, after moving into a new house. And um, she had extreme fatigue, nausea. Um, she had a lot of digestive symptoms. And I said, you know, we can do this Dutch test for sure. I don't think it's going to be uh, going to give us um, it, uh, the the information that we need to resolve your symptoms. And um, now knowing as a practitioner, first of all, our job is to give the patients what they they want because we got to keep them in the door and start working through that. Maybe we don't give them what they need right away, but maybe we give them what they want, okay? It's very, very important that I learned how to understand and navigate that situation. Um, and, you know, after that appointment, needless to say, that patient didn't come back because I wasn't, I told her literally, I don't think hormones are going to be the resolution when I should have said, let's start with hormones and then we can work through this process and figuring out other things. So I know that. So then after that, I went for a walk at lunch and like the universe does, it provides. And so I was like looking at podcasts and I was scrolling through Jill Carnahan and Beth O'Hara's on, uh, on a podcast with, with Jill. And uh, it was on mass cell activation. Now mass cell activation Mold is a, a, a big contributor to mast cell activation, but not every patient with mold toxicity has mast cell activation. So um, that was one thing that I learned. But like as we're going through, she has uh, she's describing these patients' symptoms as if she was in the consult room or on that phone call um, exactly to what these patients were describing. And I'm like, holy cow, this was like a revelation for me. Like these patients can be helped. This isn't just like all in their head kind of thing. And I think, you know, when we don't know enough, we tend to kind of use that as like, oh, this might be like a, a, a psychosocial thing, you know. Um, but there are, uh, um, if there's if there's a symptom, there is a cause. And so I, right away, I went and I took Beth O'Hara's course on mass cell activation. And I started to learn, you know, all these things uh, that were uh, contributing to their symptoms. And mold is a big part of that. And so after her course, this really gave me like a really great understanding of how we can start implementing certain strategies um, and supplementations and dietary modifications and stress management to support um, uh, these patients. And so little behold, the next and within the next month, um, I have a 13 year old girl come into my office and she's got extreme fatigue. She's got, she's been to every GI specialist because she cannot keep food down. Um, she has migraines, all, uh, dizziness. And I'm like, holy cow, this is now, now knowing what I, what I know, this is a really great opportunity to do some mold testing. So I did my whole history and I asked the mom, um, and, I, uh, the mother of, of this 13 year old girl. And I said, you know, do you guys have any, uh, a damage, water damage or mold in the house. And they're like, not that I know of. I say, okay, even though that we don't have that piece of puzzle, let's test for this because a lot of your symptoms um, uh, could be, uh, mold could be contributing to that. So we get her real-time lab test back and it's full, you know, off the charts. And so I said, look, this is, this is very high levels. We need to start, you know, creating some strategies for this patient um, uh, to start detoxifying the mold. And then we find out that the bathroom was leaking in. She, this girl's bedroom was in the basement, and the bathroom was uh, leaking into her closet. And boom! Now we have the exposure matched up with the symptoms and the testing. And within two weeks of starting her on some mast cell stabilizing supplements or, um, and also a uh, detoxification protocol, um, we were start, she was no longer throwing up after meals or vomiting after meals. And so that was a huge win for this patient because this has been de debilitating. The other big tip off for me was when she would go on vacations, she would get better. Her symptoms will all improve. And that's a common theme with these, with these patients is that they feel better, um, once they remove themselves from that exposure. And so then I started digging a little bit deeper and I started realizing that 50% of uh, houses in the United States have water damage, okay? And of those 50%, 20% of those um, will, will grow mold. So we're looking at about 16 million people affected. And then you start looking at like genetic predispos predispositions to mold and you're like, wow, okay, so this is now telling me that there, even though that you have two people in the house, um, let's just say a couple live in the house, 
one may be affected and the other may not. And if you don't have that answer, when someone comes to tell me, comes to see you and you're like, I think it's mold. And they're like, well, we both live in the same house. Oh, well, here's the reason why. And you can measure that like on a, on a lab corp, looking at some of the HLA haplotypes and it gets super complicated, but here's a little trick. There's an HLA haplotype calculator that you can use. Otherwise it's like looking at, you know, you might as well be in, in Chinese, right? Cause like, you're looking at this, I have no idea like how to interpret that. And so you find these calculators and that's one of the things that is um, very, very helpful at understanding why certain people are affected. And within that calculator, it will tell you like this haplotype is um, makes these patients more susceptible to mold or more, sus more susceptible to Lyme. And so it's one of like Richie Schumacher's uh, um, kind of findings. And it's been super, super helpful. Um, with that. So then when, when I understood the prevalence of that, I was like, okay, 60, about 60 million people can be affected from that. This is something that we need to continue to kind of pursue and make sure that, you know, we are uh, giving ourselves the tools to, uh, and be equipped to that. Um, okay. Hold like, on. Hold on. Yeah. One second. You just, I mean, I have like making notes. Let's unpack some of those things. Sure. So, it sounds like the first kind of couple cases that you saw, the presenting symptoms appear to be like GI stuff. Is that correct? They can be. They can be. Okay. But I think uh, one of the big things, too, is this is relentless fatigue. Like in a 13-year-old girl that's having relenting fatigue, like that's suspicious. Okay. Right? You, you got to okay. cover your bases with anemia and all that other stuff, right? But like, sure, it's suspicious. So if if I'm a patient and I'm coming to an integrative practice and they're doing their blood work and they're looking at iron and ferritin and ruling out thyroid and all those things. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, it sounded like those first couple cases that you got uh, presented like in the GI world. So I'm just thinking if I'm a functional medicine practitioner, um, where would I start, right? If, and I don't know if you have, in your mold patients, how often do you do like a gut test? Well, like, it, can you, can you get them better without looking at the gut? And, and the reason I say that is because as no. you know, everything starts in the gut. And so at least then my next question is, is if I'm looking at a GI map or whatever gut test you're doing, are there key indicators that I would be looking for? For example, like I do a lot with the gut test. If I think, if I see Morganella, I'm like, oh, you might have some mold. <laughs> if I look at secretory IgA and it's really, really high, I'm like, oh shit, your your immune system is on high alert. So I, that's my question is, is, you know, yeah. you knowing these mold patients, like what does that avatar on like a gut test look like? So I would say, you know, a, a lot. So, well, here, here's the funny thing uh, in, in some regards, and we might disagree on this, but, um, and that's okay. Like I'm super open for discussion. Um, what I'm finding, um, with gut tests in, in, I always, any tests that I order, I want to make sure that I'm getting information that I can then utilize therapeutically. And I've found, um, that I don't necessarily need that gut test to tell me what to do and that my protocols don't change a whole lot unless there's some sort of weird infection. Okay. okay. So I don't, I've, I've gotten away from that a little bit. However, certain things like high beta glucuronidase, right? Calcium deglucurate is a supplement that we can use that helps with phase two detoxification and hits a lot of mycotoxins uh, with with that detoxification support. So that's super helpful. If they have a high secretory IgA um, or high inflammatory markers, there could be a component to mold that. And the reason I make that correlation is that I've seen a young patient that had a ton of mold and developed Crohn's. And I, I got to that patient a little bit too late. They came see me as last resort. Um, not to say now that now what I know about Crohn's and the GI and how we can affect that with peptides and and LDN and and pro resolving mediators that would have been a different story. But this was early on in my career, right? And so if I'm looking at a mold test or a, a GI test, I might look at inflammatory markers. Beta glucuronidase would probably be the 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 two markers that I would I would look at with that. Okay, no, that's great. And so then, kind of going back to you said that relentless fatigue, the the GI stuff, this brain fog. Is, is there like a variation of like, and I don't know this, but like, is there like you have chronic mold and this is what it looks like, or I'm having, again, I don't know, a mold flare up and then that's what it looks like. Can you differentiate the two of like what that would look like? 
like um get, get, re, re-ask that question uh, okay so- let me give you an example so i have a patient that i see and i do her hormones she does ozone with me she does all these things mm-hmm. She reaches out and she feels amazing. And she had been seen by a previous provider for mold management, had done Got ozone it. and some other things. Okay, cool. She's hormones optimized, all those things. She reaches out to me and she says, I've been cleaning my mom's house because she passed away, whatever. My mold is flaring up. And I'm like, okay, like, I, I does it yeah. need some ozone? Like, well, how does, like, <laughs> what does that look like for me? So I actually, I was like, okay, well, I know, I know what I know about, especially with ozone and things like that. So I ended up bringing her in for a couple rounds of ozone. I put her on some um, BPC KPV. I actually did VIP nasal spray with her at a very slow titration. um, Just, uh, just really, really slow and kind of worked her way up. Um, and the reason why I'm not giving dosing is because I know that there are a lot of practitioners who who listen to this podcast, which is great. It will totally depend on the concentration and micrograms that you're doing. That's why I'm not giving dosages with that. But anyway, um, I saw her. So she, we've been kind of messing around with that protocol for about four, six weeks. I saw her yesterday for some pellets. And she's like, oh, my God, I feel so much better. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. And then I'm like, I think right. I just treated some mold. I don't know what I did. But, you know, like I just used some ozone and I got her on some good gut stuff. Um, oh, I also, sorry, let me backtrack. I also put her on, um, some binder and put her on a little bit of binder, um, there you go. through, I think it was like activated charcoal by designs for health or something like that. Totally. And, and I was like, okay, let's give that a whirl. And she felt great. And I was like, all right, well, there, so that's my question is I just saw her yesterday. I was like, great. I'm going to be on this podcast with Drew tomorrow. Is that possible? Like, can you go dormant with mold and then like be reactivated because of an exposure? For sure. Absolutely. And I think what you did there was really great. I think you give these patients like number one thing that you could do to make sure that like, hey, are we having, did we have a re-exposure is the VCS screen, right? That's $15 test on survivingmold.com that within 24 hours or so of that exposure, you could fail it, especially if they have some of those predispositions. And that's and VCS I've, is visual, visual something. sensitivity screen. Yep. Okay. So, so it's looking at your ability to kind of differentiate between gray, uh, black, and white, right? And there's like neuroinflammation. There's a lot of different things that could that contribute to that. But basically, if you fail that, we know that you've been re-exposed or we need to look deeper into some things, okay? But besides that, I think you do what every great clinician does. It's like, okay, we have a history of this. You had an exposure. Come in, let's get you on a few things that are going to bind up some of this mold, maybe a little bit of detoxification support and some ozone, and she got better. Perfect. Like, that's a perfect approach. Right. Yeah. No, I I think, I like I said, I was just like, oh, okay, well, that took care of that. So, again, I listen, if you're a patient and you're listening, I ain't trying to get into the mold industry. I'm just saying this patient who already knew she had mold and she felt like crap after the exposure, it it fits very much in line of, of kind of the timeline that Drew has explained with his patients. And it's then we can kind of like peg it to a, um, a symptom and, and kind of like sure. the presentation. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, so you had mentioned um, V was it VCS? Yeah. Visual? Okay. Yep. Um, so there's that. What other diagnostic tools are you using? Are they all serum? Are there, like, I think you and I have chatted before, like, total toxin burden. Is that something that you, like, give me the rundown of what are your, what are your favorite diagnostic tools? Yeah, so, so there's, there's two different camps on this, but we'll, we'll, we'll just cover um, the ones that I think are going to be more app, you know, applicable for your, your patients and some, in some of your other listeners. Okay. So there's, there's a, f- a few tests that, uh, test for urine mold or mold in the urine. Right. And so this is real times lab and then mosaics got a mycotox test. And then, um, and I'll usually use those if I'm suspecting, you know, this is, you know, mold for sure. I think this is it. And so they got the history, they got the exposure, they failed the VCS. Let's do this test. Now, if I'm just unsure, um, then I might use something like a um, uh, total tox burden by Vibrant Labs, where it gives us a laundry list of things. So even if it comes back and no, there's no mold, there may be some other things that we can work on. 
there. Um, and so if no mold tests come back negative, but they still have the history, sometimes these, these patients aren't very good at excreting it, okay? And that goes down with some of the genetic mutations. So they may be holding on to these mold and it may be scoring low until you start um, helping support detoxification. And then they might have a spike in their um, uh, real time or, or uh, other tests. The other thing I might use for a shotgun approach, if I'm just like, I, I just not sure, but I think, you know, based on some of their questionnaire that they might have some sort of infection along with this, I might use an Array 12, um, which is that uh, pathogen-associated immune reactivity screen by Cyrix Labs, right? And so that Array 12 will have a list of things where it's looking at certain antibodies to bacteria, viruses, parasites, all these different things, right? And mold is one of them. And so if they have a high um, antibodies to mold, their, their um, tolerance to mold is, you know, diminished. So then I can say, okay, well, let's start with you know some of the approaches that you um mentioned like putting them on some detoxification support putting them on a binder um making sure that they're having good bowel movements all the things that you do right and if we start to see improve okay well let's just keep you know moving forward on this and once they re their symptoms resolve then you know we win right no, that's perfect. So I know that you do so much collaboration um, with your wife, Tracy, who is phenomenal, mm -hmm. just in general, very knowledgeable in a lot of things. So when do you start reaching for peptides? And again, I don't want to get into dosing, but when do you start, you know, kind of working in collaboration with Tracy? Um, and, and like, how do you decide kind of which, which peptides to do? So a lot of times if um, either we're not getting the needle to move with, um, uh, if they're having some histamine intolerance and we're not getting the needle to move by calling that histamine response, we might reach for something like, I might refer to Tracy for some M M Lexanox or something, you know, or some H1 blockers, those types of things. Uh, if they fail the VCS screen, I feel like they have a lot of like kind of neurological components. We might use like BBC 157 nasal spray. Um, we might use something like uh, synapsin nasal spray to kind of promote better uh, or reduce some of that neuroinflammation. Um, so those are the types of you know things that I'm looking at. So if they fail the VCS screen, they have a lot of fatigue, you, you know, um, they're getting he migraines, headaches, I might give them like that, uh, recommend that they see Tracy for some uh, BPC or um, synapsin, um, which isn't a peptide, but it's a great uh, product to help with that neuroinflammation. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, there are so many new peptides that are kind of like resurfacing that we that we have just started kind of reusing. Do you have much experience with utilizing methylene blue in your mold patients or have you had the opportunity yet? I'd be curious to see what your experience was with that. No, we have not. We are just starting to implement that in our practice yeah. more. We've we've we, we've. We've wanted to learn more about it before implementing it, right? And yeah. so we're, we've been talking and reaching out to different um, pharmacists. And yeah, I think that's an interesting. It, it definitely is interesting to me to see how that. What about you? Do you guys, do you yeah, have so any? We have tons. We use like, we use <clears throat> methylene blue in our practice. With, like we use LDN. Like we use <clears throat> it a ton, a ton, a ton. I, again, I don't have, mold, I have that one mold patient that I was like, hey, I feel like this might work, but... Um, so I don't have that experience with it, but what I'm thinking with methylene blue is, is that it does support the mito it supports mitochondrial function, but it also can serve as an antifungal, antimicrobial, antibacterial. Um, it helps recirculate a lot of the ATP processes. And so when you're talking about this relentless fatigue, I'm thinking like, get them on some methylene blue and that might actually, you know, give it a whirl, um, which, which is interesting. And then, um, have you ever used like IV cerebralizin for that neuroinflammation piece of it? Not yet. Um, so we, that's another thing that we've been kind of contacting other pharmacists to make sure that we're getting a good supply of that. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, with that rental fatigue, I think you're on, uh, on track with, the. Uh, the mitochondria uh, benefits of methylene blue. Um, and what we, we, what we, you know, at the end, like as we're starting to see that all these symptoms are kind of improving, getting the mitochondria on board definitely is super important. So like after like they are, have been detoxing for a while and their symptoms are really kind of resolved, I will add in some sort of mitochondria support via supplementation. Um, and then, you know, when we had it available, you know, things like the MOT-SC, 
or um, MOTC or whatever. So that, yeah. that's another really great mitochondrial I, peptide that. I was going to say, we've been using uh, a lot of SS31 um, for that um, type of support. Uh, there's something else I was going to say, BPC, Amlexinox. Terminalizing. I can't. I can't think what it was now. Um, no, that's great. That's really, really good. From a nutrition perspective, so is there a particular like? Do you do like low FODMAP? Do you do like a whole thirty elimination? Like, where does that nutritional? I mean, like eat whole real foods and eliminate a bunch of the bullshit. Like, alcohol's got to go. Like, where do you take it with for that kind of area? Yeah. So alcohol for sure, but yeah, limiting moldy foods. Let and like let's talk about everybody's favorite first. Like that's coffee, right? So coffee it tends to be sitting around in a bag after they after they harvest the beans, and it has a high um, uh, uh, ability to uh, get moldy. And so you know, making sure a lot of these patients they're, they're using caffeine, right? They're just tr they have fatigue, so they're trying to get the caffeine, but they're they're exposing themselves with those toxins. Right. So. Um, I like Bulletproof and Purity Coffee. Those are two great companies that test for mold. So that's a really great starting spot. Um, then just kind of removing some of those foods that have a higher, you know, uh, potential for mold, like the, the fun stuff, like cheese, milk, grains, alcohol, you know, doing that. But it all depends on like how sensitive they are. So if they only have 10 foods, I can't restrict them anymore on that, right? And I don't want mm -hmm. to because we need to get the nutrient support. So it just mm -hmm. all depends, you know, food wise where we're going to go with that. Um, as far as like, so you've taken someone through like your mold protocol, what is the follow-up look like? Do you, do you do like a specific test like every three months or like, how does that work? Yeah. So we'll want to retest, um, periodically until we can start seeing those levels, you know, get to, you know, within range or zero, right? Like that's the goal, right? And, and, so, and what is it you're testing? The urine. Oh, urine point. testing. Yeah. Okay. Urine mm -hmm. testing. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, again, like there's some, there's some diff two different camps on that. And what I just go for is results, right? And so if something's working and people are getting better, then, you know, I stick with that. Um, yeah. yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, and then as far as if there are practitioners who are interested in either learning more or kind of getting some more um, kind of resources, is there a particular place that you would recommend that you have seen to be the best at like education? Yeah, I really like Jill Carnahan's website. She has a great blog on there. Mass Cell 360 has a great blog. And then Surviving Mold. Like, that's Richie Schumacher. Yeah, yeah. He's the Yeah, the Schumacher the Protocol yeah. and all those things. Okay. Well, that's awesome. That's really, really good. I'm just looking at all my, my questions, and I think I got most of them kind of covered here. Is there anything else, Drew, that you feel like we didn't touch on? Yeah, I think there's a huge part... Um, one thing that we that we have to go with uh, mentioning is the the nervous system support. So in patients, so a lot of times what we'll see is anxiety, panic attacks, those types of things, which I see in a lot of my old patients. Um, and to calm the the limbic system and the vagal nerve is super super crucial. And this can be done with any patient. So limbic system, we're going to be thinking things like the Gupta program or vital side. So these patients that are having these like panic attacks out of nowhere. And the weird thing is recently, um, I've had uh, multiple patients that have had mold exposures that have a fear of driving on, on the highway. It's not just one, it's multiple. So um, what we'll typically do is we'll start working limbic system through one of those programs, vital side or Gupta program. And then we'll also use... Um, uh, certain we try to give as much free stuff as possible so like as far as like vagal nerve stimulation gargling um cold showers and then um if they have the fin the financial ability then i would say like let's do brain tap absolutely 100 percent brain tap is phenomenal when it comes to kind of just calming the nervous system down like mm. that's that's crucial and it's a huge part um that's missing and then the other thing uh that i would say is um, as far as like our bucket that we talk about, the thing, a lot of things that patients, um, need to be aware of if they have a traumatic event, like a brain injury, we all have these buckets of like toxic load, infection load, and then stress, right? And one of the biggest things is kind of managing that and looking for that. And so it's not the concussion that made them have like kind of this inflammatory response like that. It was the, uh, the bucket that was full 
and the, to begin with, and it was the concussion that put him over. And so when we think about things like stress management, this becomes very, very crucial. And everybody wants to say like cold, uh, cold plunges and saunas and um, all these things uh, help for adapting to stress and same with exercise. And they can, as long as we're recovering and adapting from them. But in sometimes in these patients, because we already have this perceived um, um, stress response with that, we can overdo it. And one of the things that I would suggest, have you ever heard train with Morpheus? Mm -mm. No. If you have it, you need to get familiar with it. It is one of the best products out there at looking at your recovery score. Mm. So, it's a heart rate variability monitor. I think every patient should be on board with this. It doesn't just use heart rate variability, but it uses a questionnaire and it helps give you an recovery to know when we can push for the day on some of these things like the cold plunges, the saunas, and then also training, right? And so it will give you um, training zones for these patients that based on their heart rate, to know that, hey, we're not going to overtrain this patient and create a stimuli that's too much and that could potentially make their symptoms worse. That's interesting. How, do you any idea how that different, differs from the Panoe? You know, uh, so, yeah, well, Panoe is going to be more looking at like VO2, right? Like VO2 max and like your ability to like how much carbs. Yeah. But, but, it, the, but it also, I think it looks a little bit at the training zones. I've been talking to Leonard about oh, yeah. we might be getting one. That's why, that's why. <laughs> I like the Panoe and I think it's super, super helpful for a longevity standpoint, knowing someone's mm -hmm. VO2 max. The one thing I will say that this does is it gives day-to-day -day data. Okay. So if cool. your recovery score is low, it will change your heart rate zones and what you can train in for that day. So that's why I find that super, super helpful. Okay. Where heart rate zones, um, you can get, you can train in the Pinoy heart rate zones, but if you had a stressful day the day before, that may change for you. Oh, that's perfect. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's super, super helpful. I thank you so much for taking the time to get on the yeah, podcast. I blast. think this was super, super helpful. I think a lot of patients will be requesting some sort of evaluation. And I'm going to say, I preface it. I don't treat mold. I don't work it up. I would probably refer you out. If Drew and Tracy were closer, I'd be referring you over there, but they're in Wisconsin. Um, anything else, Drew? No, I just want to thank you um, for having me on here and giving yeah. me this opportunity.